All right, turn in your Bibles to John <coughs> chapter 12. And we're going to be starting at verse 27 to the end of verse 50. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Um, so back in verse 27, Christ is, and if you remember uh, before this, uh, it says that the Greeks were coming to him, and this actually prompts him to say that basically uh, now he's going to talk about his death. And of course, last time he talked about the result of his death in terms of our discipleship, that you should pick up your cross and, and likewise you give up your life as well. Um, but a lot of this passage is going to basically surround his death now and various aspects of what it's going to cause. Um, this, is the, this passage is difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is it's difficult to find a unifying theme other than the fact that Christ is dying. And, and one of those reasons why it's difficult is because this is the end of his public ministry. Uh, after this, 13 and following will be his conversations with the disciples, you know, the washing of the feet, all of that. And then ultimately his priestly prayer in 17 and then his death and resurrection. So this is the last thing, the last teaching he's going to be giving to the public. And I think John, uh, whether this is literally what Christ said in the last moments or whatever, John, I think, is actually summarizing his ministry and what has been saying before in this text. And so because of that, it's difficult to find the unifying theme. However, it does seem to surround everything having to do with his death. So the first thing is his, uh, his lament that he has to go to death. Notice he says, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. This is what his soul wants to do. He wants to say, Father, save me from this moment. Remember from the Synoptic Gospels, if it's possible, may this cut pass from me. However, not my will, but yours be done. And so he actually asked the question, should I actually say this? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? Should, should that be my desire? Instead, it's no. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. And instead, Father, glorify your name. 
And then a voice, of course, uh, calls out from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, um, so the Psalms uh, 6, 4, uh, relent, Lord, rescue me, deliver me. Uh, because of your faithfulness. So is Jesus like demonstrating that he's he's even greater than David? So David's crying out for rescuing, and Jesus is saying, I'm not even going to do that. Right. Yeah, I, I think that this is the purpose, is ultimately he's letting everyone know, I want to be rescued from this moment. I'm about to go through ultimate shame. He is God the Son. We've seen that throughout John. He's about to go through the ultimate shame of a man. Like, it's not even that he's already humbled himself to become a man in the first place, right? We see that in Philippians. He has the position of God, and he takes upon the position of a servant. But now he's actually going to be killed in the most shameful way possible among men. We would feel shame from it. Um, and not, a, not even to, co- to talk about the pain of it. Uh, it's one of the most painful ways to die, Especially the way he dies, because it's not necessarily the case that they whip everyone before you go to crucifixion. Um, Pilate whips him in order to, to try to appease the crowd so he can let him go, because he knows he's actually not guilty. But that doesn't work, so then Pilate says, fine, uh, crucify him. So he was whipped. Does anybody know what it's like to be whipped uh, by like Roman, like a, a Roman fl- flagellum or whatever? Um, typically, they would dip it in glue and then they would dip it in glass or metal or shards or whatever. And then they would, it would just rip your back to to pieces. And usually you would get a lot of lashes. Um, Now the Jews did like a 39 lash thing. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. And it probably is different for what the Romans did, but the Romans likely did something like that around 39 lashes with this, just ripping his back apart. So his back is already ripped up. And in order to breathe on a cross, you're nailed in usually through your wrists, um, either this way or if you have, you know, it going out. Usually it's a, there's a thing called a patibulum, which is on the top. So it looks like a T. It doesn't look like the crosses that we have, right? It's not like a, a piece of wood and then the patibulum put uh, across it. It's actually put on top of it. Um, so it actually looked like, a, you know, a capital T. Now, it may have looked like our modern crosses in the sense that they might have actually hung like a piece of wood on top of that and put a sign on top of it, where it then says his crimes. And we know they hung a sign on it, so they may have done it that way. Or they could just uh, nail it to the patibulum itself. But you were, you were uh, nailed into this patibulum, and in order to breathe, because you're hanging there, uh, you have to actually pull yourself up in order to take a breath. And then you, of course, let go. So he's rubbing his back that has been ripped up on this cross up and down just to take every breath for hours and hours in this hot sun. Um, yeah, so it's an absolutely excruciating. That's why they break their legs so they can no longer do that because they're put, they're, your legs are helping push up as well because eventually you're t- you're, you can't have, how many pull-ups can you do? Um, and so you're pushing your legs up. They, they break their legs so eventually they just can't do it anymore and they suffocate. So it's a, so you realize why he doesn't really want to do this. However, um, for this reason, I came into the world, he says. And instead of looking to himself and all the horribleness that he's about to go through, he prays to the father and says, father, glorify your name. May you as a, what does name mean? Just glorify, you know, the, the words that I call out, what, what, what does name mean in John and frankly throughout the Bible? Character. Yeah, character, person, who you are, that's your name. Um, and so he's basically saying glorify your person, glorify your name, glorify who you are. What does it mean to glorify? Beauty. Demonstrate. Well, glory means beauty, right? So glory means beauty or... Um, some sort of admiration or something. To glorify means what then? Show the character. To what? To, to like demonstrate the very character. Yeah, to demonstrate. Yeah, I would say ascribe beauty, um, <coughs> ascribe a- admiration uh, to your person. And, and in this case, obviously recognizing who God is, because we're not ascribing beauty He doesn't have. He actually, we're actually recognizing who He is 
as God. And who is he? He's the God who saves us, who is actually letting his son go through this horrific thing to save you, to forgive you of your sins. So it's not just like, well, he forgives you of your sins, but not really willingly. It's like, okay, you're bad, but I'll forgive you. But really, like, I, I don't like you so much. No, that's not it at all. Actually, because he loves you so much, he sent his son to die this horrific death for you. Um, so that he is pleased now when you confess your sins and are forgiven. Because that's why he sent his son. He didn't send his son because he's under the illusion that you're good and perfect on your own. Uh, he knows that you're wicked. He sent his son because he knows you're a sinner, and this is what he did to forgive you. So he gladly forgives you. There's a part, there's a, a place in the gospel where um, Christ has to let the people know, don't be afraid. The Father wants to give you the kingdom. This is his desire. He wants you to inherit eternal life. This is why the son was sent. He's not begrudgingly like forgiving you. So the son is happy to do this, even though this is not something that in his human desire he would want to do because you, you know, who would want to go through this? Yeah, well, before time, God has set his love on you, yes. Um, and therefore had planned to do this in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, this is, this is the, uh, the part of their, uh, uh, what's it called? Ugh, now I'm going I'm to blank on it. It's a covenant they make with one another to do this. Right. Because he, because he only, the, yeah. So I, yeah, I had a blog I post that I did a while ago that says the father only loves the son. And literally he says it in John, right? The father loves the son. His love for us is that he, he uh, chooses to include us in the son so that he loves us. Before the foundation of the world. Right. So That's in, why he sent his son. Right. In, well, so before the, found, in, before the foundation of the world is a human way of saying eternally. Right. Because there, there is no before for God, right? He just eternally exists, uh, transcendently exists. So in that sense... God has, this is a wild thought. God has loved you for all eternity. There was not a point where he started loving you. He has always loved you. His entire exist for his entire existence, which is eternal from all eternity to all eternity. God has loved you and God has decided to do this to save you and has known that this will, will happen to save you and, and, and has caused this to save you. So, I'm not sure this is a common topic, but what would you say to someone that says that uh, God doesn't need to love his son in order for him to have love? He can love without actually loving his son. Yeah, so his son. that's interesting. So I would say love always has an object. Um, it is impossible then to actually love. If you want to say that love is a feeling, but the problem is, is that the Bible describes love as actually caring for another, uh, uh, doing for another, that sort of, that's love in the Bible. The father can't do that unless something else exists for him to do that. So if the father, let's say God is one person, then he could not be loving. Loving could not be his attribute. That could not be an attribute of God. Love has to have an object. And if you say, well, God, you know, he eternally loves in the sense of, creation, that can't be, um, we, we believe that he eternally loves creation, but that can't be the uh, reason he has love, because his love has to exist logically prior to creation. Otherwise, creation itself, God depends on creation existing for him to exist. So God has to exist before, you know, again, logically, obviously not chronologically, but logically has to exist before he loves something which means that creation, and creation is not God, um, so it can't be creation that's his object. Whether you think Jesus is creation or we're creation or whatever, that can't be the object. The object must be also God in order for God to be eternally loving. And so it must first be God loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Spirit loves the Father, the Spirit, lo uh, you know, the Spirit loves the Son. That must be the first relationship logically 
And then logically, the second object would be the elect in his creation. That, that's a, that's a, like a chicken, what comes first, chicken or the egg, if you say, well, the object is something that's created later on. Well, the problem is, is that, well, God couldn't exist unless that existed then, because it has to exist for him to be loving. Um, you can't have the object, you, you can't have the love without the object, and therefore it's dependent on it. Right. That's why every, every other, look, that just, that just proves Christianity right there. Because everyone says God is love, no matter who you talk to. That can only exist in Christianity. It doesn't exist in any other religion. Um, because, you, again, you, ha you would have to have some sort of uh, plurality within the Godhead. Right. Yeah. So, so, so that the very thing that disproves modern Judaism as just monotheistic without with being Unitarian or disproves Islam also disproves oneness Pentecostalism. Yeah. Because you, you have to have another person within the Godhead as an object of the love. Or, or, or people can deny that God is love, but the scripture is real clear that he is love. So that, that is a core attribute of God. Um, so, yeah, so the Father is glorified, and this voice comes out of heaven, and he says, I have glorified it. Obviously, God has been glorifying and showing himself through the scripture, but I will glorify it again, and he's going to glorify it again through what? Nope. What, what, what's the subject that we're talking about? Through the death of Christ, right? So this is the great irony is that God is going to be glorified through the most shameful act in human history. At the point where he is going to be shamed, the son is going to be shamed. And look, if the son is shamed, are you ashamed if, if your son is shamed? You, you get shame if your son is shamed. So this is the shaming of God, and yet it is the glory of God in this shame. Men are shaming the son, but the son keeps saying here, no, 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 I'm not going to be shamed. I'm going to be glorified through this. This is my glory. You will see who I am, who the father is, and the beauty of who we are in being loving in this act. So this is actually revelation. The, the cross is revelation to us of who God actually is. And this is why the New Testament is very clear. It's look, if you are a son of chaos and you are doing evil, you are a murderer in the world, then yeah, God is a flaming fire. He is a consuming fire to you. He is absolute wrath and all of that. But if you are one of his sons and you are in his son, then God is love to you. And he will do, he will go to the ends of the earth for you. He will die on a cross for you. He will be shamed for you. And that's how he'll be glorified. Aren't they also <laughs> borrowing from this idea that uh, the ancient Near East has about uh, ultimate commitment, ultimate sacrifice, ultimate um, expression of worship is killing your son and, and literally destroying your image to show your devotion, to right. show your absolute um, love. Love. Your love for who, though? Well, so that's the problem. Is that's right. always been the the object has always been a dead god. Right. So so this is being done in the ancient Near East and the rest of the world to show your ultimate love and commitment to a god, and now you actually have God <coughs> sacrificing His Son to show His love and ultimate commitment to His people. Yeah, it's completely reversed. Yeah, and it's like you know. Uh, Abraham and Isaac, right, on the mountain. Like, that's not crazy in that culture. That's actually oh, no, pretty really normal. Common. Very common. common. Yeah. And so God actually, even then, like, reveals his redemptive plan yeah. that I'm no longer <laughs> going to require you to demonstrate in some petty way by killing your kid, your firstborn son, your love and devotion to me, but I will take this and I will do that uh, I will literally kill my son. Yeah. Well, even in that passage, he, uh, it's interesting that Abraham says to Isaac as they're going along, and Isaac's like, where's the sacrifice? Yeah. And Abraham's like, God will provide the sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Now, there's there's kind of a double meaning there, because it's like, does he mean Isaac? Because that's why he's going there. But at the same time, it's weird to say God will provide it because you're already here. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, God does provide a sacrifice in his place, uh, which is the ram that's caught in the thicket. Um, and we and we absolutely believe that that represents Christ later on. That's a, a typology of Christ. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's an amazing thing that God has done, and we pass over because we're so used to it. It's we're so it's so common to us. Yeah, I've heard that Jesus died on the cross a million times, <clears throat> but do you understand? Do you get it? That God has loved you so much that He gave uh, His Son for you in this way. Um, people are going to spit in his face. We're coming up on that. They're going to put a crown of thorns on his head and take a reed, and then they're going to grab the reed from his hand, and they're going to smack him over the face with it. He gets punched by the priests. This is God incarnate, and he's allowing them to do this. He's allowing the Roman soldiers to nail this stuff through his wrists. He's allowing all of the mockery because of you. He allows them to do that. In fact, he's going to say, look, I, I, because, because of you, I didn't come as a judge this time. So if someone doesn't receive me, I'm not going to immediately throw fire from heaven and kill him. I have come to save my people. So I'm allowing the unbelievers to be unbelievers for a while because I'm in the process of saving my people. Now, when he's done with that, then yeah, then he's going to come and judge those who are unbelievers. But right now is the time of salvation. I know I'm skipping and, and jumping that verse, but since we have already done that, let's talk about it for a minute. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time that Christ is saving his people. Now is not the time for judgment. Should you as Christians call forth judgment upon nations, upon people in your prayers? interesting question or should all your prayers be oh lord save these people oh lord save this nation oh lord i'm about salvation i i I remember in chicago going down the street and there was like this street preacher or whatever um and some guy said something to her that offended her personally it had nothing to do with like the gospel or anything and, and she was like, you're going to burn in hell. And what was interesting it was very clear that she said that not as a warning, but as almost like it's like the Christian way of flipping someone off. Um, that is not the attitude of Christ. There's, a, there's a, a place in the Synoptic Gospels where there's people mocking Christ as he's walking with the disciples. And the disciples are, hey, Lord. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? So let's kill all these people. And Christ is like, you don't know what spirit you're of. Indicating that that's not the way the Holy Spirit works right now, because right now I'm trying to save people. So the Holy Spirit in you would actually cause you to say, all right, sir, I I take no offense. God God bless you. I pray that he'll save you. (coughs) That should have been the response. That's the spirit of God in this age for Christians. If anything else, that's not the spirit. You're, you do not, do not know what spirit you are of. I don't mean that you don't condemn evil. I don't mean that you don't say, hey, look, the, the wicked will be damned. The wicked will perish. They are going to hell. Yeah, absolutely. You warn and you do all that. But your spirit shouldn't be, and I want them to. I don't want them to be saved. I want them to be damned. Think of Jonah and Nineveh. Jonah wanted them to be damned. God wanted to save them. That was his purpose. Jonah did not, even as a prophet, did not represent God accurately. And of course, if you ever heard me teach on that, Jonah actually represents Israel there. And God is rebuking Israel for, frankly, not being faithful to their mission to be priests. You are a kingdom of priests, not because you all are interpreters of God's word. That's for the special priesthood. You're all priest to the world. You're the priest of that unbeliever, whether they know it or not. What does a priest do? He talks to the guy about God. He represents God to the unbeliever, and he represents the unbeliever to God by praying for that unbeliever. That's how you're priests. 
So Christ has come to save, not to not to condemn. This is this is the point. When he returns, that's when he'll bring judgment. Right now, he's saving. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <coughs> you just think of that. I mean, for yeah. the most terrific thing that you could have done to you. Yeah. Well, it does say here that this voice has come for your sake, not this voice has come for my people's sake. Right. Yeah. So his hope is to save everyone. Yeah, and, well, and, and in the context, he's talking to people who actually don't believe. It says that some of them believe, but they won't actually come out to admit it because they're worried and all that. Um, and yet he says, look, this, this voice came to save you. And yet you still don't believe. Um, and so it is, it's God's purpose to save. However, we're going to see in a minute that when it's not received, God's going to harden as well. Because he makes the statement here, that look, while you have the light, make sure that you listen. Um, it, actually, let, let's go ahead and read this passage. Uh, it says in uh, verse 35, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you might become sons of light. So he's talking to the unbelievers. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So even with the signs, they were not believing. Remember that they didn't have the superficial faith. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report uh, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed Therefore, they could not believe. They could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he, referring to God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So there is a judgment there when people don't believe, but the, the initial response of God is not, well, I'm just going to keep everyone from belief. That is a misunderstanding that I think a lot of Calvinists have. God is not the one preventing people from believing your wicked heart, your love of darkness, as John has said, because your deeds are evil, that prevents you from believing. Your love, here in the context, the, the leaders, they, don't, they won't actually confess Christ. Why? Because they love the glory of men rather than the glory of God. They want men to ascribe beauty to them. They want men to like them. They want men to admire them rather than God to actually think that they're beautiful <coughs> in what they're doing in their confession. <coughs> yeah, so they choose not to believe. Every man chooses not to believe. This is a hardening because men choose not to believe, and now they can't. That's why Christ says, look, while you have the opportunity, while the light is with you, believe. Because it's only going to be here a little while, and then I'm going. He's talking, uh, obviously, about he's going to be crucified again. It's surrounding his death. But that remains true even for those who hear the gospel. You're being given an opportunity to become a Christian, and that opportunity is not until you die. That opportunity is until God says, okay, you have disbelieved. You have rejected my message. I, therefore, harden your mind. You will now become set in your mind that Christianity is not true or I don't need to follow Jesus. And that's the way you'll go because I will not allow you to believe now. That'll be a judgment of God. You'll be given over to depravity, unbelief, as, as Romans 1 says, right? That they're given over. They're given over to what they're already doing. God's not initially doing it. This is a confusing concept. To me, yeah. Okay. Because I, I, because you brought up like a lot of Calvinists fall into this is because we believe that God calls you and you can't, you can't, you can't come to God yourself. So it seems to be like this dichotomy, like this interesting dichotomy here of like you have on one hand we can't choose God, but we're choosing to sin. But if we can't choose God, how can we choose to sin? Right. So it, here's here's I think what's clarifying is. You can't choose God not because God's blocking you in any way. He's actually putting himself out there. He's put his revelation into the world. He's put natural revelation into the world. So every man actually knows of God. The problem, as John has described it, and frankly the rest of the Bible describes it, is that we don't want to come to God. 
in our sinful nature, we like doing evil and having a king. We like being king over our own lives. Having another king, we don't want that. Um, so we actually are blocking ourselves from coming to God. And that's why the scripture says you can't come to God because you love yourself too much. You love your sin too much. So you are incapable of actually loving God and coming to him. That's why God now must pour his love out into you so that you choose him. And he's only chosen certain people to do that. He has his elect for that. He doesn't give that to everyone. The others, he actually renders judgment. You don't believe. I've given you all this opportunity to believe, but you love yourself rather than me. Therefore, I give you over. Now you can't believe, period. Uh, not, not because you can't believe because your own nature, but now because I'm also blocking you. I'm also going to send blinders on you. Not God personally, but he'll send out like the devil to do it or whatever to block you and blind you. Um, so does that clarify a little bit that in other words, God's not the one blocking you initially. It's you blocking you. Um, God only saves his elect out of that but as a judgment for those that are not his elect, he gives them over as a judgment for what they chose. Because a lot of people think, oh, you know what? Well, I, I'm damned because God chose this for me. And it's like, no, 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 no. You chose it for you. And you're damned because of what you chose. God saves some people out of that. He, he chooses to render judgment on others, but that's God's choice. But he hasn't made anyone choose wickedness. Now he has caused people to choose what's good and right because we wouldn't have otherwise, but he doesn't cause anyone to choose what's wicked. We automatically have done that through our love of ourselves and love of sin. Well, that's how he's both just and, uh, and merciful, mm -hmm. right? So like justice is we're all standing at the river and God says, obey me and live or get in the water and die. <clears throat> and everyone jumps in the water, or at least Adam jumps in the water with all of us in his arms. And so we're going down this river of death with, you know, a waterfall at the end of it where everything is destroyed. And God comes and he pulls people out. So he's just in that he, he's just in that he, uh, he, is, he has shown himself, he has communicated, and we are rebellious in that we have thrown our lives into death. Yeah. And he is merciful in that he comes and pulls his elect out from death. Yeah, a point that's often made is that ultimately sinning against God, refusing to believe, refusing to follow him, every man should be damned. And it's not every man should be damned because God made them that way. It's we've ch God didn't make us that way originally. Uh, we've chosen to follow the devil. We've chosen to love our sin uh, over God and to love ourselves, our own lo lordship over God. And so we've chosen this. Um, God now comes along. He says, uh, I'm right and just to condemn all of you, but... I have set my love on this person. I'm going to grab them out. This person will grab them out. And this is where people actually have the problem because they're like, well, why, if God was really loving of everybody, which is what I'm told by my Sunday school and everyone who doesn't actually read the Bible, um, if God loves everybody, then why need to save everybody? And the answer of course is that God doesn't love everyone. Uh, not in the, not in the way that we're talking. Um, that's for the elect that he has decided to choose these people. Paul says, what if he actually chose the people to be damned, the, the vessels of dishonor, in order to show his mercy toward the vessels of honor? That is his elect. In other words, in Brant's, uh, Brant, in Brant here. Thank, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> in Brant's analogy, um, what if God lets some people go over the waterfall so the people he rescued can see, this is what I saved you from. Now you can understand who I am. And by the way, understanding who I am is life itself. So by you understanding who I am, you get eternal life. And apart from you understanding who I am, you can't have eternal life. So I can't actually save all those people in order to save you. Because if I save all them, you can't be saved either because then you won't know who I am. And knowing who I am is eternal life. I know that's really complicated, but that is, in fact, I think, why God does this. Romans 9. In order to love you, he must judge these others. And you must witness the judge of those others so that you understand what God saved you from, how he showed mercy on you. 
and therefore understand his nature as loving you. I think just because we come from Adam, we already have a depraved mind. Right. So we're naturally, you know, you can't serve two masters, right? Right. And at some point we choose to be our own king. Yeah. But why does he have to turn us over when we're already turned over? I think it's it's basically to it, get more get more crazy more right more, it's, it gets more of a grip on you. I don't know, right? Yeah, it's it's basically and and this is talking to people who've heard the gospel, right? So it's not just talking about to anyone. So, some people, yes, in their depravity, it's really when you know the truth, you see the truth, and and it's been you're confronted with the truth that denying it does something to where the spirit of God is like, I'm done withholding these demons from your life. I now withdraw and these demons can have at you. And so that's really what it is. It's a, Peter describes it as the dog returning to his own vomit or the, uh, the pig going and in, in, into the, so he becomes worse. The, the first, the last state becomes worse than the first um, because he's denied truth. Um, God's like, okay, well, because even for the unbeliever, God's holding back. The devil wants to kill everyone. So even for the unbeliever, he's holding back all of that. At that point, it's like, okay, well, you're going to reject me. I no longer hold it back. You will be completely blinded. You will be completely set to you don't believe Christianity is true and you don't believe that's true. You won't be able to see anything at that point because you've rejected the truth. Is it like to show the logical conclusion of what sin is going to be? Yeah. I, I think it's, the logical conclusion is that sin... Um, chaos, if we put it that way, uh, breeds ultimate chaos. So if I'm going to do something that is destructive, I will ultimately see full-on destruction. I mean, that's, that's basically all, all the judgments of God are that way. Think of the flood, for instance. Oh, we're going to practice chaotic things in our sexuality. We're going to murder human beings. We're going to do that. God's like, okay, let me show you what that looks like. You want a humanless world and what you're doing? Let me show you what a humanless world looks like. Boom, flood. Getting, um, getting back to the earlier conversation where it started, you make a decision to deny Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Or you make a decision to accept Christ. Right. There is your human will, willful decision there. Right. Right? Yeah. Like that, the doors open and he's it right. Yeah, you're, you're making a genuine decision, yeah. Right. Um, Obviously, we believe that the reason why you're making a decision to accept Christ is because God is pouring out his love into your heart. God is regenerating you, and so he's pushing you to make that decision because we are left on our own would just keep doing what we're doing because we love what we're doing. Right. Um, and so, but, but, to do, but to keep doing what we're doing is he doesn't need to do anything for that. We decide to do that. And I think in order to find out that he's pouring his love out to you, you need to seek the Bible. Correct. Yeah. Read the Bible in order to see the love that He's giving you because this is His Word. Is he? Right. Yeah. Right. And well, and I think that might come to you in a dream or something, but you know, or through creation, maybe. Right. Right. Natural revelation, but but you're right. Yeah. Specifically, I think if you're regenerated, you the will. Not gonna, the world is not going to show you love. Right. No, they're going to show you the hate of the devil. Right. So, so if you're regenerated, you will genuinely seek him and seeking him through his word is where he's at, right? That's how we connect to him. So this, this honestly is talking about supra and infra lapsarianism. Right. That's, that's what this is touching on. Yeah. yeah uh, let, let's, let's, let's discuss those. Let's, uh, let's discuss those words since you might hear them. Yeah. Um, probably won't, but, but since Brent <laughs> brings them up. No, it, I think supra. Up. Back me up. Supra, okay, so supra, la, lapsarian is referring to the fall. Um, so lapsarian means fall. Uh, supra means basically in disregard of uh, the fall. So uh, apart from the fall. Um, infra lapsarian means in view of the fall. So people ask, well, does God elect the saved and, the, and who's going to be damned? regardless of the fact that men are fallen. Meaning he just decides to make a people and he chooses these group and he says, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this people and they're going to be damned. Um, and, and that's not a judgment based on their sin because they haven't sinned yet in, in his thinking because uh, he's not taking into consideration the fall. That's supra. Uh, we, for the most part, I mean, I do, and I think, I think all the elders do deny supra lapsarianism. 
I don't think that's true. I don't think God renders, I, I think that would, that would make God unjust in my mind. Um, that's problematic because I think God does not judge people apart from their sin. I don't think he renders a negative judgment on someone even though they've not sinned, like absent of their sin. So I think God, in view of the fall, in view of the rebellion of man, renders judgment on these people and says, okay, all people, I render judgment on all these people. I will save this group from them. And the, ju the, the judgment of these people is just because they actually, in view of the fall, have rebelled against God. That, does that help clarify? Yeah, <laughs> All right. Uh, any comments or questions so far on the passage? I think I don't know if we're gonna. No, that was really good to talk about because I think that a lot of people, you know, think that again, Timothy, I think, really he wants to save everybody, and I think that right. he does. I think a lot of Christians can't figure out why some are saved, what some are not. But yeah. Some must be not, so the others can see. Right. Right. You know, there's a lot of. I, I think I think what's important for everybody, kind of thing. Right. Right. right yeah. Know, that whole thing. Well, and and that's where you get. Out of Timothy, or I'm thinking. Yeah, First of... Timothy. It talks about. Uh, well, it, really, a lot of the pastorals talk about that a bit. Now, usually, that's talking about all kinds of people. Right. Even here, it says, if, "If I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself." But then in the passage, it shows how all these people are not coming to him. So. And then in the book, it's like, you can't come unless the Father draws you. So it's clear that the all men refer to not just Jews, but basically all men from all over the world, uh, all kinds of men um, uh, from all nations and whatnot. The, the problem with the, like, God just loves everyone theology is that you end up not needing Jesus then because, well, he just loves everyone, not understanding that actually God loves Jesus and those he loves, he puts in Jesus before, from before the foundation of the world so that he then has love for them. So Jesus is core, primary, absolutely necessary. And that's why later on, when he's talking to the disciples, he's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one can come to the Father except, one exception, through me. That's the whole point. Because God loves his son. He loves those he puts in his son. But apart from his son, that's it. He does not love those people. We're getting back to the, before the foundation of the world, yeah. his elect. So he doesn't know exactly who his elect is going to be. He knows there's going to be his elect. No, he, no. so by, by elect, we, he means he, he picks out the specific people. The course, of our self, the course of our life, we have a choice to make, right, to follow him or not follow him. Correct. He doesn't know that answer before the foundation of the world. No, he does. So because he knows everything, right? So God actually knows, the, the scripture says God knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. We don't know. We're the ones who actually don't know. But God knows all of it. So he actually, when I say he loved you, I don't mean he loved this nebulous group of believers, but he had no idea who they were. I'm saying he loved you for all eternity, specifically you. And it has elected you to be in his son so that you would be saved from all eternity. And so... Very much he's known his elect. In fact, that's why in the book it says, look, my sheep know my voice. And he talks about how he knows his own and all of that. He's always known us, uh, even before we were born. Long before in eternity he's known us, and he's loved us, and he's planned for us. And it's not because he looks down in the future and says, oh, that one's going to pick me, or that one's going to pick me. He already chose us out before the time. Right, we choose, well, John will say, in, not in this book, but in his epistle, we love him because he first loved us. And so our love for him is a response of his love for us as the elect. Um, so, no, he doesn't love us because we loved him. Uh, he loves us, or we love him because he loved us first. Can I uh, read uh, Romans on this, uh, 9.18? It says, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What it, uh, will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? 
Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, and this is to the point you're making, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and make his power known, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? Which he, pre- which he has prepared beforehand for glory. And then it'll keep going yeah. and Jews and the Gentiles. But. Yeah, I, I think that's the point. Being made. That would have made God a process. God, that he know is trying to learn from your actions if I'm going to choose something. Well, yeah, that would be, uh, that'd be open theism, right? Yeah. Open theism is the idea that God doesn't actually know uh, anything. He just kind of learns as yeah. it goes along. If that were true, actually none of this could happen because this is all coming about through his plan and process. Like Christ couldn't be killed <laughs> on a cross. He would never know that because ultimately uh, it could go another way. You could choose something else and he didn't know. So he actually has to know not just a couple things. He has to know everything in order for this to happen. Um, and that's, that's clearly that's the way God has presented it throughout scripture. God knows everything. Uh, and so everything is being worked out in accordance with his plans. Could you shed light on verse 34? Yeah, what, uh, let me see, what specifically? Like, the crowd then answered, like, you know, we have heard the law and the gospel is right. to <clears throat> remain forever. Yeah, so law in John, law in John, is that what you're asking, the, what does the law mean? Or what law it's referring to? Uh, no, it's saying, like, uh, we have heard out, the, out of the law that, Christ is to remain forever, and how can you say the Son of Man? Like, uh, what exactly their uh, mentality is? Like, say. Yeah, so they're, they're reading Old Testament texts that talk about the Davidic king will be reestablished and he'll remain forever. Um, and law, of course, in John refers to the Bible in general, not just you know the Mosaic Law or something. Isaiah 9 is one, like Ezekiel 37, Psalm 110, Psalm, I think, 86, 89. Um, Yeah, texts like that, that that basically the, I mean, really, I mean, a lot of books. Jeremiah talks about it. The NET is actually saying that it's it's likely referencing Psalm 89. Okay. uh, Verse 35 and, and, and following here once. And for all I have vowed, by my own holiness, I will never deceive David. His dynasty will last forever. His throne will endure before me like the sun. It will remain stable like the moon. His throne will endure like the skies. Yeah. Um, talks about it too. Yeah, in reality, it's a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot, lot of lot of verses. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a shock for them that if he is the Messiah, he is going to die and leave. In fact, this is a Jewish objection if you ever talk to Jews about the gospel. It's like, well, the Messiah was supposed to stay in forever. And uh, the, some of the theology of the New Testament that I think is not really known very much is what's considered the already not yet. And that is the idea that Christ actually is reigning, but in order to save people, and he'll say this later on in John, he must go away because he has to act in intercession for his people while he's saving them. Otherwise, they're not going to be saved. So he has to go to the Father. He's reigning from heaven. He will return and forever be in that line. But he, it starts now at the cross. From this point on, he is reigning as David, the king. It is forever. But they think, oh, he's going to physically reign in Jerusalem the entire time. And what he's trying to say is that will come later. But now I must, I'm, I must, must go to the Father, and I'm, I'm going to be lifted up in the cross, and I'm going to reign from that period on uh, from heaven. So that's something they don't understand and have to get. Even the disciples don't get it until later. They don't understand it either, and that's why they're so depressed that he died, and they don't understand why. And then when he's ra- raised from the dead, they finally start getting it. And then the Holy Spirit, of course, is given to them, and they really get it, which, again, is something that John's going to mention later. All right, anything else? Comments, questions? I was reading uh, one of the commentary on this particular, from, uh, for, uh, like not a commentary actually, but one of the, in the new, te- uh, the second temple Judaism, uh, uh, it says like the light verb, uh, which, uh, sorry, the light that has been used over here, John is actually, that light is actually used as a messianic title also for Christ, the, the coming Christ. 
Right. So when John was using light, also he was trying to point. I'm not sure, like, you, you might be knowing on that. Yeah, you mean in Second Temple of Judaism? So, like, if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a teacher of light yeah. that's talked about, things like that. The light is like a Masonic title. Right. Coming. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like that. Yeah. And John is, like, actually using that vocabulary to say, like, because then he's going to say the light is in the world now with you, and then it's going to go away. Yeah, I, I think that, um, so, although I think that's true, I think John's probably, uh, marshalizing on that but ultimately it's connected to his opening in the book where christ is the light of like genesis right the light of creation and therefore the light of of truth in that regard and so light is being taken from genesis in that regard um does that correspond to yeah it's also a messianic title yeah i think i think that that helps john's message but remember his whole point is that the light is coming from god um himself and it's not just a human Messiah, it's actually a divine Messiah. And that's, that's why I think John then, you know, constantly homes in on Jesus is the light because he's actually God. He's actually God from God is the idea. So even the Nicene language, uh, God from God, uh, it's that light from God, right? Light from light, God from God. Uh, that's really Johannine. Uh, the Johannine idea of Christ and light. I see, like the Jews, if they are assigning a Messianic title, like light to Messiah, and also they have this piece of position subconsciously knowing that Genesis 1 is actually the reason why. Right. It's like so tense, like why they can't uh, discern that that Messiah is going to be a divine uh, son. Because, like, I'm trying yeah. to. Well, was, because they're blinded. They're blinded, like, yeah. exactly. I was trying to do a uh, sound too. Also, in that particular light, where the yeah, uh, you know, the, uh, the nations rage against, against the Son of God. The nations are raging, and one commentator says like this: that actually, uh, uh, God is actually appointed his Messiah on the throne, whereas people wanted their Messiah to be on the throne. Yeah. But actually, they are looking for their Messiah. Right. But God wants his Messiah, and hence they are raging for. They're looking for their Messiah who allows them to live as they have been living in sin, but gets rid of all these other people like Romans who are not allowing them to live even in luxury to the degree that they want to. So salvation to them is get rid of these people who are stopping me from having my best life now. Whereas God's whole plan is, is that, no, you need to be changed because you're wicked inside and you love darkness and you love your wicked deeds and I need to change you. And so the salvation is not from these people outside stopping you from having your best life now. It's you who's stopping you from having eternal life with me. And that's salvation. That's something that he has to get across to the people and that he ultimately says only the Holy Spirit actually can bring this across to people because they're not going to get it otherwise. Brian, I want to know, like, do you see, because this passage is actually about the crucifixion of Christ, like, you know, but do you see, like, uh, like um, uh, I'm, talk, talk, I'm thinking about the cultic sacrifice of what Christ, like, being as a human sacrifice, do you see this thing as a parallel where, like, God actually wants to this kill Christ, kill would be not the right term, I'm sorry, but, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, uh, well, God is pleased to put him to death, right? Uh, yeah, pleased to put him to death, yeah. in order to destroy the image of Adam, which was simple so that the new creation can be in the image of Christ now. Right. Do you see like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that is what's happening, right? He is putting to death all of humanity um, that is sinful in Christ. Obviously, he's letting the others who don't believe in Christ remain. They're going to be put to death in the second death, which is hell, at the end. But he's putting all in Christ to death on the cross. That's why Paul constantly says, like, I have been crucified with Christ. And then he'll say, you have been crucified with Christ. Because uh, God is crucifying us with Christ so that he also will raise us with Christ in eternal life. The word, isn't there a scripture that talks about him making all things new? Yeah, that's the book of Revelation. Yeah. So we are living like in the new creation uh, model kind of thing like right now. Right. Like the, 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 yeah, the already not yet. So already not yet. Yeah, it's, it's come. And we've partaken of that in John. We've taken of that spiritually. So we've been regenerated. And now we wait for the rest of us to be reborn, which is resurrection of the, from the dead. Uh, with the body. All right, let's go ahead and uh, end in a word of prayer. And actually, Ritish, you want to pray for us? 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for who you are and what you have done for us, Father God. We adore you, we love you, Father God. And teach us, Father God, that how beautiful you are, Father God. Lord, as we have read from your word today, that what length you have gone to bring us to your, bring us to you, O Lord, to see your love in the cross of Christ, Father God. That we may love you, that we may see your grace in the cross, of Father God. Lord, we ask you now to help us to understand the meaning of your word, O Father God, that we may understand your word, meditate upon it, O Father God. And also as we go from our, from this our house to our houses, O Father God, that we may take your word and live according to your word, O Father God. That each and every person who, who is who is, who is over here, O Father God, let these words not fall in the deaf ears, O Father God. Least we, we be like those people who have ears but cannot hear and eyes who cannot see, O Father God. But Lord, let, let, let the living spirit in us, O Father God, be so accustomed to your word that, that the life will be transformed in and out of Father God. We ask you, dear Lord, to guide our lives as we go from this place, O Father God, in our day-to-day journey. Uh, uh, help us now, dear Spirit. Um, uh, in, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. <laughs>